Okay, this one's interesting. Whenever I do body contemplation, it appears that the sex organ is more predominant. Help. <laughs> Prominent in the visualization. So, this is the result of probably a sexual fantasy because we train the mind to visualize the sexual organs with interest and so because we do do that and we do it repeatedly when you come to think of the body that's what comes up body parts are that one and so we have to go against the grain and train it in a new way so if you can and just come back I think teeth are really good because you can just kind of go and they're right there, aren't they? It's like, you come back to the perception of the teeth. Because, you know, you've got this perception that the body is this soft, fleshy thing, a warm, fuzzy thing. But when you do that with the teeth, what's that? For me, that, I come to the perception of the teeth, it's not difficult to hold it in mind. And it's not far from where the thoughts are as well. Look at that. Any new habit, you just have to train it again and again as you kind of grind down the old habits. And pornography is very dangerous and becoming more and more common. It might not be a problem for many people in the room, as many of you are pre internet, although I know you'll use the internet, but I think the next generation's in big trouble. It's addictive, and that part of the mind that gets fascinated, the key laser that is into those images and those postures of arousal, if you bring the mind to bear on that again and again and again, it's an incorrect form of, it's not right mindfulness and not right concentration, it's unskillful mindfulness and unskillful concentration. And what it will result in is when you try to make your mind peaceful, that's exactly what's going to come up. The things that you paid attention to. So, very dangerous. And I think Mara is very pleased that the internet made pornography so much more available. You know, the Buddha was recommending that practitioners go to the charnel grounds because in the old days, perhaps poor people or people who died in auspicious deaths, they were just taken to the forest and their body was just left there. So monks and nuns, serious lay practitioners could just go and have a look and they'd see corpses in different stages of decomposition. And, and myself, these days, the forest monks, what we do we tend to go and look at autopsies in Thailand. You can get permission to go to an autopsy and you go to the morgue and you see last night's death, kind of cold on the table. And um, we kind of commit those images to memory. I've been more than 10 times now, I'd say, to the morgue. And so this is a kind of a powerful opponent perception. So, opposing perception, you go and see dead bodies. And it's very sobering, you find that the sweat breaks out on the brow and the face goes pale and it really goes in quite deeply. You see dead bodies. And uh, then, of course, when they cut them open and you smell the intestine, they kind of urge to throw up. You have to kind of say, don't throw up. And then the nausea comes in a wave and settles down. But what happens is the mind becomes very clear. This is this thing about when you pay attention to the truth, delusion falls away. And just looking, and I've done that. I just kind of choose one part in particular to look at. And that might be the blood or the liver. Because they take out the brain and they take out the heart and they take out the liver and they do these little tests trying to find the cause of death. And... Um, after different times, one time going in and just really focusing on the blood so that in my meditation I can recollect that perception. 
another time I just really focused on the bones because they saw the skull and they cut open the rib cage. So if we're serious about uprooting delusion, we have to have a look at the body. You know, the way media and the way pornography portrays human bodies, it's not actually very truthful. It's uh, somewhat fabricated. But if you pay attention to it, the mind becomes deluded by it. More and more and more so. And, you know, it's good to challenge where that goes. Like, I ask your permission to speak frankly. Is this look at what dogs do. I mean, dogs are always sticking their noses in genitals. And so, if one is doing this either on the computer or, or in one's fantasy, kind of always looking at genitals, you know, the mind is going to the dog realm. And this can be a really good wake up. Do you want to be a dog? Look at the food that dogs have to eat. And look at the way they rip each other apart. In Thailand they don't take care of dogs very well. So you get to see that dogs are so cute for the first year or two. But because they're malnourished and because they don't get vaccines and they don't get parasite treatments, they, they're getting mange. And then the next generation of alpha male dogs are on the street and they're kind of chasing them away so they get less food and they get really beaten up and they get really sad and you can see this really fast cycle of birth, aging and death in the dog realm because they don't live that long and you can see this kind of puppy joy they're so cute and they're so happy and by about three years they're kind of lying there in the gutter depressed the dog life wasn't as good as they thought it was so it's horrible animal birth is horrible and so we want to be careful what we do with our minds and Ajahn Anand was saying in that Dhamma talk the more you see the loose nature of the body the more beautiful the mind becomes so you have to know that experientially to do it enough to see when you let go of unskillful fascination and delusion the mind becomes bright and happy and clear. And then there's a feeling of contentment. And you notice that when the mind is craving for something outside of itself, it's painful. Somehow what you are and where you are, it's not enough, it's not good enough, it's longing. And when you feel content, it's a relief. It's a real relief not to crave for another, seeking pleasure from another being's body. But it's one of those things, getting that kind of result takes work. So the habit of the mind is going to go towards craving and sensuality, very strong kilesa. And Lord Buddha said if there were two kilesas as powerful as sexual lust, it would not be possible to be liberated. He said, but because there's only one which is that powerful, you can take it out with a lot of hard work. So, you're all sincere Dharma practitioners, you're right, you can do the hard work. Yes, Peter? That's a good question. And uh, that's where this, that's where this, uh, the Buddha says, if you fall to the lower realm, the chances of being reborn as a human again are equal to the turtle coming up once every hundred years and its head going through the one bamboo ring floating on the ocean. Very, very difficult. You see the way those dogs get kind of torn apart and dejected and malnourished and disease ridden, they're not going to die with happy minds. So the level the consciousness is at when it dies. I think what it, what it usually depends upon is merit performed in the past eventually ripening. 
So if there's a strong act of merit somewhere, then at some point that may ripen. But the thing about the animal realm is you keep making bad karma as well. It's not, and they don't consciously make good karma. And there's a dog at Ajahn Nun's monastery, which is, interestingly enough, exactly the color of a robe. And uh, this dog would come into the sala and listen to the Dhamma talk. He did this for years. And the monks, the lay people got fed up with it, so the monks tried to discipline it. And the disciplining got quite fierce, so whacking it with a broom, throwing water bottles at it, yelling at it. And it still came in to listen to the Dhamma talk. So Ajahn Nun did a bit of investigation. And uh, it couldn't understand the Dhamma, but it could feel the coolness and the heat of its mind would, would cool when Tanajan was speaking Dhamma. Anyway, it turns out that that dog had been a novice that ate at night time. So it had the merit to be, I think it was dunked in the monastery. And Ajahnanan had this policy, no dogs in the monastery, but it's interesting, once this dog arrived, Ajahnanan allowed it to say, I don't know if he knew it as a novice, I don't know. <laughs> but uh, I think it's still alive, its name's Chocolate. <laughs> so, you know, if you're close to monks, and you're living in a monastery I mean, that dog it might be working through some bad karma and then coming up again I think the cats in our monastery have a good chance of uh, human birth because they get a lot of affection from humans hmm? Tommy